Last night, we hosted Cecile Richards at Sixth and I. She's the outgoing president of Planned Parenthood. She's an icon. And while I listened to her talk about her life as an organizer and her hope for the future and the many women that she's mentored and the w many women, including her mother, Ann Richards, who mentored her, I couldn't stop thinking about Faith Frank and, and Greer Kadetsky, the protagonists of The Female Persuasion. Like Cecile Richards, Faith is a feminist icon, and the book starts when Greer hears her speak as a college freshman who doesn't really know where her life is going to go, and then she hears Faith. All of a sudden, she knows. Faith becomes Greer's mentor, and together they form the core of a complicated and nuanced and deeply engaging big American novel about feminism. The Female Persuasion is a true novel of, idea of ideas, but all of Meg Walter's novels are. They're smart, they're empathetic, they're perfectly plotted, they're deeply felt, and usually they're funny as hell. Her contribution to the American literary scene is huge and it's ongoing. So it's only right that she's joined tonight by one of America's leading book critics, Ron Charles, who's the editor of our very own Washington Post book world. So it's a pleasure to have them here tonight. Please join me to welcome Ron Ch Charles and Meg Wolitzer. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I have never felt so extraneous. <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. <clears throat> One of the only downside of being Meg's friend is that I can't review her wonderful books. Uh, I finished it today, sat there on the sofa, kind of tearing up, and then wrote her a note and told her how wonderful it is. Uh, you've just done a great, great thing here. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it seems weirdly, presently on the money. I mean, with the Me Too movement and the election of Donald Trump, what you call the big terribleness. Uh, <laughs> so did you start writing the book pretty much on election night? Yeah, I hired a lot of people. We all sat in a room. They called themselves Meg Wallitzer, and mm -hmm. uh, we, we got this thing done. I assumed that was the case. <laughs> no, I, I started writing this book three years ago. Oh. And these are all issues in the book, uh, ideas about uh, female power in the world, misogyny, the person you meet who changes your life, that I've, that I've just been thinking about forever. And, and in some issues, you know, in some cases, writing about forever, too. Did you find yourself revising the manuscript over the last year and a half? The only thing that I went back and, and really changed was after the election, yes. I did that big terribleness part. Because I wanted to <laughs> thrust the characters into the future because there was this sense in a way of things for women maybe getting a little better and then a little worse. But what if everything got ripped out like a tablecloth and a magic trick? Um, I wanted to sort of explore that. And then as I did that and as time passed and there were women sort of coalescing around these ideas, there's like a hint of that in there as well. But you can't write, and you shouldn't write, at least I shouldn't write, a novel to keep up with every event. I actually had a student in my first workshop that I taught who was writing basically in real time and she was writing a novel and one chapter began, tonight in class, Meg said, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't believe in writing that no. way. I, I, you know, this isn't meant to be of the moment. You, you want your books to sort of reflect on things in a slow way and about time. So you won't write about the impeachment for the paperback. Oh, that's true. It's a good point. That's a good oh, point. The major uh, relationship in this book is this mentorship relationship between uh, Greer and this uh, feminist icon. Faith, a sort of Hawthornian name, I think. Uh, yes, everyone says that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, did you have mentors in your life like this? Were you mentored? I know you are a mentor to many younger writers, but did you, when you were younger, did you have female mentors? I didn't think of them as mentors at the time, but starting in first grade, I had this wonderful teacher, Mrs. Gerby, and she knew that I, I it's like a name, also Hawthornian, no, not really. Um, <laughs> And she invited me up to her desk to dictate stories to her because I had a terrible big handwriting and, you know, like a mural-sized handwriting, and she, you know, would, would write them down. And I was kind of, she was kind of like uh, my secretary, and I was like an executive. Take a letter, Mrs. Kirby, you know, like that. <laughs> and, um, uh, but the fact that she saw something in me didn't need me to do anything, like didn't need me to be good. She just sort of was offering her services. And I think in a way, what a mentor does is 
see something in you, but have no expectations. Hmm. As I got older, um, there were different, these are women, I mean, uh, in my adulthood, Nora Ephron, actually, who is one of the dedicatees of this novel, was someone who was really, really important to me. Uh, her first film, This Is My Life, did anyone see it? I'm gonna have to ask the rest of you to leave. Um, <laughs> a few people did, but it made no money. But she was, of course, a wonderful, well-known writer, an essayist, a novelist, uh, a screenwriter, and she wanted to direct her first film, mm -hmm. and it was it would be based on my novel. And she and her sister, Delia Efron, wrote the script together and then they worked to get this made. And if you think about it now, it's a studio film about a mother and her two daughters, a mother who's a stand-up comic, Julie Kavner, and her daughters, Gabby Hoffman and Samantha Mathis. Now some of you know what I'm talking about, yeah. Um, they invited me, Nora in particular, invited me into the process. Mm -hmm. We went around to look at stand-up comics in like, uh, late eight, early 90s New York. So basically we're talking about women with big shoulder pads and big hair. Um, she, there was one night she wanted me to come to something and I was very, very pregnant with, with my first son. And I was like, it was the last Lamaze class. And I was like, I don't think I can miss it. And she's like, I'll tell you what they were gonna do that night. <laughs> <laughs> so I went with her, a very good choice. And the thing about her is that she always, um, was encouraging to people whose work she admired and who she liked, and she would take people out to lunch and believe in them, and it allows you to believe in yourself in some way. It's a great way to start off, and I was very, very grateful. You do it yourself now to other younger writers? For a price. <laughs> um, no, of course, of course I do, but it's not something that you say, it's not like a formal thing, like you're dancing a gavotte, you will be my protege. You know, it's not like that, you tip your hat. You have to like each other, I think. Do you have, do you have? Oh, life? many. Most of them are here. <laughs> <coughs> no, no. Uh, I, would you read a bit of the novel for us just sure. to get us a sense of the voice? Yes, I will give you a very little bit from the very opening, a kind of amuse-bouche to get you into it. I like reading from the opening because you don't have to tell people all these details that they don't listen to anyway. Like, I find when I go to a reading and they start saying, and then the ant moves out of the farm after they sell it that terrible winter, and I just, I'm gone. I have not, I don't listen. I don't know about you. <laughs> So here you don't have to listen to any plot. Greer Kadetsky met Faith Frank in October of 2006 at Ryland College, where Faith had come to deliver the Edmund and Wilhelmina Ryland Memorial Lecture. And though that night the chapel was full of students, some of them boiling over with loudmouth commentary, it seemed astonishing but true that out of everyone there, Greer was the one to interest Faith. Greer, a freshman then at this undistinguished school in southern Connecticut, was selectively and furiously shy. She could give answers easily, but rarely opinions. Which makes no sense, because I am stuffed with opinions. I am a piñata of opinions, she'd said to Corey during one of their nightly Skype sessions since college had separated them. She'd always been a tireless student and a constant reader, but she found it impossible to speak in the wild and free ways that other people did. For most of her life, it hadn't mattered, but now it did. So what was it about her that Faith Frank recognized and liked? Maybe Greer thought it was the possibility of boldness, lightly suggested in the streak of electric blue that zagged across one side of her otherwise ordinary furniture brown hair. But plenty of college girls had hair partially dipped the colors of frozen and spun treats found at county fairs. Maybe it was just that Faith, at 63, a person of influence and a certain level of fame, who had been traveling the country for decades, speaking ardently about women's lives, felt sorry for 18-year-old Greer, who was hot-faced and inarticulate that night. Or maybe Faith was automatically generous and attentive around young people who were uncomfortable in the world. Greer didn't really know why Faith took an interest, but what she knew for sure, eventually, was that meeting Faith Frank was the thrilling beginning of everything. It would be a very long time before the unspeakable end. So that's just a sense of it. Nice. nice. That's the thrilling beginning of a great book, too. And not only does your novel explore <clears throat> the conflict in our society between women and ancient trends of misogyny, but it really gets into the conflict within feminism itself in a really interesting way. Well, well, there's different generations in the book. There's the younger women and Faith, who is the second wave feminist, who founded a magazine that was uh, a less famous feminist magazine, less famous than Ms., called Bloomer. Um, and she's she's described as being like two or three steps down in fame from Gloria Steinem. Uh, 
So there's the sense of the world passing her by and people who are critical of second wave feminists, she's getting a lot of that criticism. But then there are the young women and what are the conflicts between the generations? I mean, I really, for me, it's all about character. It's not like broad swaths of these women painted this way or that way. Right. It's about um, idealistic Greer and Faith, who's seen a lot more than Greer has. How do you position yourself in the feminist movement? Have you thought of yourself as a feminist for a long time? Did you think of yourself that way when you were younger? I am the daughter of a mother who I think was really affected by seven, second wave feminism. Um, my mother is a novelist, Hilma Wallitzer, who is 88 and who whose parents didn't encourage her or think it was important for girls to go to college, but she was really pretty much an autodidact and kind of, you know, took writing workshops, but taught herself really to write and had an ear for language and for reading and was very helped, I think, by the encouragement of other women. And I, I saw that growing up. I actually was in and sort of helped sort of construct a consciousness raising group when I was in junior high school. Um, Saying the phrase consciousness raising group now sounds like I'm talking about a butter churn or does, something does really sound very hippie. Really hippie, right? But we got together at each other's suburban houses in Syosset, Long Island, and really? <laughs> really? Exit 43, yes. And so exciting. And um, my people are everywhere. <laughs> And uh, like we waited until like somebody's mother would bring down like an Entenmann's cake, and then we'd be like, you know, go away, no, don't listen. And then we would talk, and we wrote away to the National Organization for Women asking for a list of topics, and they sent us a list that was like orgasm and you. Well, what we really wanted was when your parents won't listen or PSATs don't stress out, you know. Um, but we found our way. Uh, so. The long answer is yes. I definitely feel that I was a feminist early on. And, yeah. I love the way the novel writes about the conflicts within feminism today. Faith is dealing with criticism from younger uh, people of color who are feminists. Right, and she's called like, like you know, white lady feminism or finger sandwich feminism. Yes. It's fun to make up <laughs> hashtags, I have to say. Um, <laughs> Like that one, finger sandwich feminism. Um, yeah, I mean, the the criticism of feminism being out of date and elitist, and uh, yeah, uh, I tried to, but that's not that's not the point of the book. I mean, I'm using these as sort of shape ways to sort of shape the dynamic really between who is the person who sees something in you and changes things. How much do you owe them? How much can right. we compromise? A lot of issues along those lines. Yes, it's a <clears throat> the the faith. For, uh, Starts a foundation, which is funded by a kind of corrupt hedge fund. Can we give that much away? Sure. Okay. Uh, and this, this le I just have. And this, this but don't tell them about the car <coughs> crash. No. no, there's no car crash. Uh, and this leads to a crisis uh, in the novel that affects Faith and Greer in very different ways. Uh, one of them is very disillusioned by this. Is that a generational thing? Uh, is that something everybody has to go through to realize there are no pure organizations? Or is that just Faith's own problem, you think? I think it's a combination. I think idealism is something that you need as a motor when you're starting out in life. And then you come to uh, reevaluate it. It depends on who you are. Uh, right. Some people retain while retain some of that light while not being idealistic in the same way, but they have to retain the energy and the sort of certain charge that they felt and not become sour. Yeah. Can we talk about Corey? Sure. So the uh, main, the only, only male character or certainly the only main male character? Well, in the Emmett is sort of one Yes, of okay, right, yes. Other than him, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, and Bill and Tom and... <laughs> all those guys. That yeah. scene with that Steve. marching and the, band. And, <coughs> and the Robert Bly scene. Yeah, no. love that. <laughs> He seems to me like a real male feminist hero because he starts in a very traditional way. He goes into finance. He's going to be, you know, the guy, the successful male. Right. And then he ends up in a very different life than he anticipated. He's very caring. He ends up doing what men would think of as women's work. Uh, and although it's a horrible event that takes place, uh, he finds some happiness too. I, I love not really having, um, you don't want to move your characters around like pieces on a chessboard. Uh, he's someone I liked very much and I, I created this uh, a family tragedy for him that felt right 
for his story. And he started to change. So I just started to sort of see in what ways. But he, yeah, I mean, there's this notion of doing good in the world, making meaning that I think my young characters really have. But then there's a sense of what does it mean to make meaning in the world? Does it have to be in some broad way like Faith does? Um, one of the some one of the characters, uh, the best friend Z, uh, says in a kind of angry scene late in the book, "It seems to me that there are two kinds of feminists: the famous ones and everyone else. And what about people who just quietly make a difference?" And who I think stand Corey, and wait. Yes. Yeah, Corey is one of them. <clears throat> yeah, it was very touching. And that was a devastating tragedy, by the way. Oh, both thank you. I instantly called my daughter. We both complained about that. It's so just too sad. It is really true that you hear from readers about things that you do to characters. They really get you. Now that you're like reachable on all <laughs> platforms, uh, they sort of, you know, and when they say of like, in my book, The Interestings, um, you know, one of the characters dies and and readers sort of were mad yes. and like you know why did well I'm gonna say he she die and I don't want to give away the gender um, and the answer the glib answer but sort of the true answer is because he she did because yeah, that was people do die yeah yes. they have been known to yes. um, but people also write you the these things I, I when they when your characters are sort of as big as the ideas in the book right. people write you a, like a list of questions like <laughs> I have a list of questions for you what did Corey and Greer do the following year? Like where, <laughs> they're projecting into the future. Right. You know, when did they get the, their AARP membership? Like they're moving <laughs> the characters through life in some way. And I guess you've done your job, but of course you can't answer those questions right. accurately. But it means that you've really affected people. You've made these people real in our lives. That I suppose is what we need novels to do. Someone said that what we remember of the novels we love isn't plot but character. And I yeah. think that's probably yeah, true. Exactly. A few years ago you wrote an essay for some other East Coast paper uh, called The Second Shelf. Yes. It was an essay about how books that women write are marketed and received. Then you write a novel called The Female Persuasion. So how have those pressures affected the way your novels are received and the way you write and the way you go out and talk about your books? Well, in that, in that piece that I wrote for the East Coast paper, the Syosset Tribune, no. <laughs> 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 um, the New York Times Book Review. Um, <clears throat> um, I, one of the things that I talked about was the different ways in which books by literary male writers and literary female writers sometimes looked. And there was a sense of sometimes, and again, People write you angrily and point out exceptions. Of course, yes. there are plenty of exceptions. But uh, that books by men sometimes had big typeface and sort of suggested to the reader, this book is an event. And sometimes books by women were marketed with what I called little girl in a field of wheat. And you can't, and that they were basically <laughs> excluding men as the potential readers. Because you couldn't really imagine two men, say, standing on a train platform. What's that you're reading, Bill? Little girl in a field of wheat? Yeah, I loved it. You know, you can't. <laughs> You can't see that happening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> except for you, Ron, who will read yeah, anything. I'm on the subway, carrying my books in a J. Jill bag. Right. <laughs> because books, you want a book to open the world to anyone. I mean, there was a study done in that same, uh, that reported on in that same East Coast newspaper uh, about how fiction teaches empathy or creates the mm -hmm. possibility of empathy. And we all kind of knew that. Like people, you're coming to a reading on a Friday night. I mean, you know that that's true. Because I want to say, like, don't you want to know how other people live? Don't you want to know what it's like being other genders, other races, living in other, just living in other bodies? And I think of fiction that way very much. I could have called this book The Every Person Persuasion and tried to game the system. What do you think? No, next, it would not have worked. Next printing? I no. don't know. <laughs> um, you try, you know... I'm just, see, well, I hope I have male readers as well as women readers. I know you do, yeah. Uh, and your publisher's good about positioning your books and making them look attractive and exciting and like events. Uh, there is no, we, we don't get the back of some woman's head turning away. Right. That's a, yeah. That's a thing, it's, right, Oh, it's right? such a thing, yeah. What does that mean? We found hundreds of examples once for a feature we did. Uh, there was a, uh, oh, one last thing on that. Did you see, did any of you see online uh they did if uh great novels by <laughs> <Yes>. right <laughs> men had like girly covers and there was one of the road that was made to look like chiclet it had like a road with like flowers <laughs> strewn around the end of it uh yeah that's it's great it's very it's very limiting uh 
persuasion. Uh, is there a Jane Austen echo there, or is that Definitely. Not totally off? No, no, you're you're uh, not off at all. The female persuasion is the title of my book, but also within the book, Faith Frank has written kind of inspirational, kind of you know, sort of feminist clarion calls uh, back in the day, and her book was called The Female Persuasion. And then in the '90s, when tech got big, she wrote one called The Email Persuasion. <laughs> following that with diminishing returns. But it, but the title is also a pun because there's the notion of women persuading one another and that's a big theme in the book, really. You're really funny. I mean, you're funny here, but you're also funny in the book. And as I read different reviews and interviews around the country, it struck me that the themes of this book are so contemporary and so of the moment and are so important uh, that we were missing that. I mean, this is a really funny comic novel. Thank you. I'm There's so There's no glad. question there is it, but I want you to respond to the issue of of humor in yeah. fiction. That it's a it's a sticky subject because uh I, I sometimes feel like writers are supposed to like uh, sort of be serious and have great gravitas without humor on the page and then get up and do shtick. Yes. But that isn't true, of course. I mean, there was a great essay by Zadie Smith that I love called Fail Better. Uh, yeah, good. Some people have read it. And, and uh, in it, she says, and this is a line that I really love, when I write, I am trying to express my way of being in the world. And I think that if you are doing that for yourself as a writer and you love humor... Why would you keep it out? You'd keep it out maybe because you thought you weren't supposed to put it in. Yes. I mean, there are books, there are certainly books I love that have no humor in them. Disgrace by Kutsia. I don't That's think it was, a, you know, not of course. Not very funny but, at all. Um, but I think in here, the humor comes from little observational moments. Sometimes I'll do a little aside because why not? I think the beauty, one of the beauty beautiful things of the novel is that you can take some side trips. They may not be kind of like the agrarian section of Anna Karenina, you know, but <laughs> you can go into just a little moment. Like I had a moment with Greer as a child sitting with a slightly dark humored girl in her class. I don't know if you remember this. And the girl says to her, do you ever think about poisoning our teacher? And Greer... And Greer says, no. And then the girl says, yeah, neither do I. <laughs> and I just like, that has nothing to do with anything in the book. But I put that in because it felt right for like the moment with the weird kid in school. And, it, and it, while it served as humor, I think everything runs on two tracks. I think things serve a kind of dual purpose in a novel. Otherwise, you really kind of want to take them out if they're there in a show-off-y way. But this sort of, for me, it populated this sense of her childhood as be, sort of sitting under the blackboard, eating Pringles with this girl, not really fitting in, being shy, it, you know, and having to sit with the weird girl who would say something like that. Yes. <laughs> Would you take some uh, questions from the audience? Sure. We've got two mics, one there and one there. You have to stand in line at the mic and then wait for Meg to recognize you or point to you if she doesn't recognize that you. It could take a while. Yeah. Hello. Is it on? Yeah, okay. Hi. Um, so I saw you at the National Book Festival a couple of years ago, and you said something that really, really stuck with me. The interviewer kind of asked you about YA novels and the fact that Beljar was so dark and twisty and how, you know, the, like, can't we go back to the good old days where everything is happy and we're talking about good, good, you know, leave it to beaver type stories, and you kind of push back. You're like, well, no, like, why novels have always been like this, like this is life and I need to write about life. And with that, and I'm excited to read this book and with the interestings, like I just feel like you you tap into that really well. Um, I don't know how, like if you have comments on kind of how you kind of hit that growing up kind of experience, that time of life, et cetera. Um, yeah, so YA novels um, and writing sort of putting darkness into them. It's not... I, I, Maybe that's the wrong way to say it because that sounds like it's an extra ingredient from the outside because I don't see it that way. When I was when I was young, I loved to read The Darker the Better. I mean, I really, really, I read this book, Lisa Bright and Dark. Uh, oh, good. I'm so, wow. And you know, it's so funny because I'm like, my heart just like, be still my heart. Like, what is it? It's There's something about the books you read when you're young that you think about them forever in a certain way. And I think it's because, and this is why I, I also, you know, wrote this book, Bell Jar, uh, which is a little pun on the Bell Jar. Um, it's adolescence is a time of firsts, 
And it's such a powerful time because people are seeing and feeling things for the first time. So having a character in The Interestings who goes to summer camp and meets these kids and finds her cohort, and having this character, Greer, in this book, who finds her way through things happening for the first time. And in Beljar, um, this sense that like no one else has ever felt these feelings. I remember that so well. Another book uh, that I read was My Darling, My Hamburger, Teenage Pregnancy. I was like this goody goody kid reading about pregnancy and mental ill. I mean, because you know, it's like taking in some of the darker aspects of the world in a way that you can manage and then controlling them, thinking about them and organizing them in a way. So I, I, I find a, a great usefulness in reading those books. Thank so you. thank you. I loved Lisa Bright and Dark, by the way. So glad. <laughs> I remember it vividly. Are, are you able to tell me where you got the inspiration for the summer camp and the interestings? Because I went to a summer camp called French Woods in upstate New York that sounded, I mean, I felt like it was my camp. It was a performing arts camp. I was in your bunk. No. You might have been. <laughs> Don't you remember that night, spaghetti night, and I said that thing to you? No. I, so the weirdest thing has happened with the interestings with regard to summer camp. Everyone thinks it's their summer camp. But mostly, if I actually could sort of draw on a wall, French Woods is losing to Bucks Rock. Okay. Bucks Rock is the one that, and I sent my kid to Bucks Rock, but it was, okay, I went to a camp that doesn't exist anymore and is, uh, was so wonderful called Indian Hill. And it was in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And in fact, it wasn't really called a summer camp, apparently, because I was on NPR um, Weekend Edition, I think, when the book came out, and right after it aired, the phone rang, and there was this voice. And I, when I picked up the phone, this voice said, it wasn't a camp, it was a performing arts workshop. <laughs> and it was the then 94-year-old owner <laughs> haunting me and I loved her so it was it was great she was very so I had that experience but I so I did go to this program we'll call it a program in 1974 and I wanted to act that summer and I was so terrible regardless of the play it could be like zoo story or godspell I spoke in what I'm going to call my Catherine Hepburn voice mother where are you where are you mother it was terrible it was like that was it but <laughs> so easy to, like, look at this, it's so easy to make laugh. Um, uh, but I, and I also became super pretentious that summer. I would carry around big novels under my arm, like hoping somebody would see. So all you could see under my arm was like the magic mount, you know, like you couldn't see the rest of the words, but you knew that it was like a big important novel. I left there knowing that I wasn't going to be an actor, but I was so excited by sort of art that summer by art and, and I think that I became a writer although I tried to keep a diary this is something that I did starting when I was around that age and I wrote in it very diligently thinking that maybe someday it would be kind of like you know the Bloomsbury the Syosset version of the Bloomsbury group you know tonight I watched Bewitched you know like that <laughs> But I got really bored after a few weeks of this and I stopped writing in it. And then I found it months later and I felt really guilty because like, you know, again, what if something happened with me and, you know. So I went back on every blank page I wrote, nothing happened today. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that is the genesis of that book. But everything moving forward from that summer is completely invented. <laughs> so I love the book. Thank, thank you. you. Did your mother encourage you to be a writer or was she... Did she say, hey, this is too hard, uh, no. become a doctor? No, um, yeah, right, <laughs> become a surgeon, right, yeah. Uh, no, she absolutely encouraged me. And there's a scene, actually, that I put into the interestings that was something that came from my life. Uh, uh, during the Q&A of an event that I did, a woman stood up and said, my daughter really wants to be a playwright, but I know how difficult it is, particularly for a woman, but for anyone, really, to, to make it in that world. What should I tell her? And I said, well, is she talented? She said, yes, she's brilliant. And I said, well, and is this something she absolutely feels she must do? And she said, yes. And I said, I think you should say, well, that's wonderful, because the world will whittle your daughter down, but a mother never should. And my mother never did. And, uh, you know, it might have been just as good advice to be protective and say something different, but she didn't. She was absolutely encouraging, and, and I'm grateful to this day. That's a great story. Great yeah. Story. Um, yeah. 
Hi. Um, Hi. So I had the question regarding your main character in this book. I'm very similar in age to Greer, and I thought that the college scenes were um, very realistic to my experience. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about it, if you would be willing, um, how you lo- not learn exactly, but like how do you how do you so vividly um, draw an experience that's not your experience. It's challenging. I mean, at one your of, advanced age. I know. No, I didn't mean that. She just cited a she just cited a summer camp in the seventies. So I'm not like out of turn here. I feel like you I'm, and Tom Wolf are always talking about this, aren't you? I feel like right now, like I'm the feed the birds woman in Mary Poppins. <laughs> No, one thing that I did do really is like I this is I'm not kidding, but I would call my editor up and her assistant would answer and be, Hey, before you patch me through, Lindsay, um, when you were in college, what kind of a feminist do you should consider yourself? And she would tell me and then I'd go, Okay, now you can connect me. Um <laughs> uh I think listening to people is really important and hearing a lot of things. It's also about Faith's experience in uh, you know, growing up and, and sort of becoming a feminist in really uh, the late 60s and early 70s, as well as the young ones. You want to get things right. Um, I, um, one thing that I really did do is have a lot of people read it who are younger as well as older and say, really be ruthless. Is there something that sticks out here as emotionally wrong or you know, just sort of uh, it feels like an anachronism in some way. I think that the thing about experiences is that at the end of the day, these being a young person starting out in the world has commonality across generations. So I hope that some of it is, is even, you know, could be true of women of a previous generation. You have sons, right? I do. I have sons, yes. In their 20s? Yeah, they're in their 20s. Do they read your books and give you advice? Um, we're working on that. <laughs> we're, working, we're working on that. Uh, that's always a weird thing, too, because, you know, it's a, it's a little bit sort of embarrassing having a, a parent who's a writer. I, when I actually, I remember I was walking, I live in New York City, and I was walking down the street with my uh, son when he was, I don't know, about five years old, and we passed a McDonald's, and there was a sign in the window that said, now hiring. And he went, Mom, look, you could, you could do that. You could do that. Because th- there was something a little unsavory about being a writer. Of course, this is the same kid who always said to me, what's your favorite baseball team? What's your favorite baseball team? And I said, I don't have one. He said, what's your second favorite? <laughs> so consider the source. <laughs> You once told a funny story about kids in your grade school mocking you by reading one of your mom's oh my God, books. Yeah. So my mom's, uh, my mom's, my, one of my mom's really good friends is here tonight, and I was like, "What? How are you going to report back what I, what I said?" Um, so in my mother's first wonderful novel uh, ending that came out in 1974, the same summer that I went to that camp, in fact. So it was actually an important summer for her as well as for me in terms of sort of art and awakening. She was 44 when her first novel came out. Um, when I got back to school in the fall, this group of like really mean boys went to a bookstore, get this, bought the book, you know, a literary novel, read it, the whole thing, <laughs> to find like a sex scene so they could sort of, you know, like, you know, like kind of make fun of me about it. But in a way, I want to live in a world in which, you know, people will take the time to (laughs) read a novel. And if I have to be mocked a little bit, okay. Those were not mean boys. Well, they were as mean as Syosset got, right? Am I right? (laughs) (laughs) There must be other questions here. Mostly they just want to talk to you, I think. No, no one? Uh, yeah, okay. Hello. It, it would be very interesting to me uh, to have you uh, say a few words about uh, how you see the development of men since you have young sons, and I have sons probably around the same age as yours. I'm struck by the difference there is between my son and his attitude toward life women and all of that, and I'd be interested in you're just giving us a little bit of your sense of how you see uh, the male personality uh, wow. from the point of view of what you've written about, and particularly f- for the younger generation, not so much the old timers. How do you raise good men? Wow. I, you know, 
as a novelist, I I don't I think of men as being different you know, kinds of men. It, there are different kinds of men in my novel. Emmett, as we talked about, is sort right. of the old style kind. Within the younger generation, there is a lot of uh, stuff that we still don't want to see. I, I think that you raise good men by, you know, showing them, you know, what's real about being a woman and, and I don't know, and making them read The Secret Garden when they're growing up, <laughs> as I did, uh, every night. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I love your writing, and I'm Thank always you. interested in uh, the writer's process and, you know, what a day in the life of writing is for you. Um, so could you talk about, you know, how you go through writing? Sure. Now? Are some of you writers? Yeah. People are always, like, a little hesitant to say they're a writer because they're afraid, like, they're going to run into each other. It's like, oh, you said you were a writer. I haven't seen anything of yours. <laughs> <laughs> And that was a month ago, <laughs> that bookstore. Um, you know, it really depends. Like, when I am in the heat of the book, like, I, when it's cooking a bit, when you, when you figure out what you want to do, I feel like I don't want to do anything else but write, which is kind of nice that I'm an empty nester. I hate that term, though. Again, it's the Feed the Birds woman, empty nester, AARP card, all my discounts at Avis. Um, uh, but I, I just want to work all the time. But I think that I, I try to, I'm, I'm so disciplined when I'm working that I, one of the things that my students who have made it in some way have in common is that they all work all the time. They just work a lot. And I think working a lot, um, but, but not forcing it when you're having a bad day. I think sometimes going and reading something uh, by a writer that you feel that the writer was excited, a passage in a book that the writer was excited by is a great way to break things up. Um, but I, I get up in the morning, I like I like the early part of the day, I feel like it's diminishing returns. Are you, are you this way with work? No, okay. Um, while everybody's sleeping, I like to get stuff done and then the afternoon gets a little low blood sugar and then I can kind of, you know, do something else. Thank you have you. the whole novel plotted out, or do you let these characters no. just tell you what's happening to them? I have something that I jokingly call my 80-page plan, and I will share it with you tonight. Um, which is, I mean, take it for what it's for what it's worth. Uh, I I love the idea of having a kind of a problem or something you're thinking about. You know, people say write what you know. For me, it's really been write what obsesses you. Uh, what are you thinking about all the time? What are you thinking about constantly? And that's always kind of a good way into a novel. Novels are like advent calendars. There are a lot of ways in that you could sort of get into a novel. But for me, an idea, and then once I have the idea, characters sort of form kind of like tadpoles and start to kind of say, I'll take that. And then you can use the characters as ways to sort of explore these ideas that you're not sure about. And I like to then write for around 80 pages without worrying, is it good? Will it shame my family? Uh, will it get good reviews? Nothing, none of that. Just like the idea of play is something we don't really talk about enough in terms of writing. The play of er the early parts of writing. Uh, so I get around 80 pages, which is enough pages to feel like you've really done something, you've accomplished something, but it's not so many pages that if you put it aside, you'll feel really, really bad. That's a great idea. And then, at that point, I leave the house, I move to another country, I, no, I leave the house, I sit in a coffee shop, I print out, I've printed out what I have, and I look at it now, and it's not what I wanted to do, but it's what I actually have done. Right. And at that point, I'm crossing out the worst terrible grandiosities of it. And I start to shape this thing. And now, only now, do I feel I can really plot it out. Hmm. Because before then, you're plotting out... Not, how can you plot right. out something you don't understand? Well, some authors do, though. Some authors do. I, I, don't, I would right. be interested in asking them. Yeah. Um, but and I you, don't know. You start with the characters. I start with the idea, and then the characters, and I try to go free for quite a number of hmm. pages. Hmm. So, uh, my childhood friend from Syosset, David... Popper, who lived, I have to say, who lived in the house behind me, and we were really, really close friends, and I'm so happy to see you. So happy to see you too, Vag. Question about your writing evolved. Obviously, I've written, read your books of you as you've gone through the years, and just curious, like, do you ever think about if you went back and you wrote, rewrote Sleepwalking or Hidden Pictures now, like, how would it be different? 
Well, I don't ever go back and look at my work unless I sort of have to, but usually they only want you to read from your latest work, you know. It would be weird. Sometimes people quote lines back from you. Somebody actually quote said, oh, obviously this, the title of female persuasion was a nod to the wife, this novel of mine. And I said, mm. why? <laughs> they said, well, you know, because of that line. And there's apparently somebody uses the phrase, oh, a, a writer or person of the female persuasion in a kind of coy and somewhat damning way. I had no idea. <laughs> it was like someone else had written it. I sure, I mean, the thing is like, for instance, the interestings, my, I went to that summer camp, my closest friend to this day is from that summer. And we always talked about, we had what we called Indian Hill sightings. You know, we saw somebody on the Crosstown bus who, you know, we knew, or, or we would talk about that summer over the years. And I said to her, why didn't I write about that earlier? And I think I answered the question for myself, which is that the book would have been just a nostalgic look at one summer, but in fact, it's, a, it's about aging and it's about what happens to talent over time. So I think that it would have been, all these books would have been really, really different if they didn't have my own experience of a lot of things, mortality, you know, um, just sort of also, in fact, a novel that I wrote, The Ten Year Nap, um, I feel a little bit now like I'm kind of like saying like hits like Melanie going on the road and saying <laughs> brand new key and then breaks into it. Um, I, you need to live sometimes to have a book come out a certain way. So yeah, they would have been different. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. no. oh, yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Hi. So about humor. Humor. You're obviously funny and humorous, and you have a wonderful audience, male audience here. He is the funniest person <laughs> I know. You know. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> yes. Being a female writer is difficult enough. Being a funny female writer, because humor is such a powerful thing, and it kind of belongs to men in a way. <laughs> men, I think, <laughs> kind of resist. How do you? How does your? How does your humor go over with men? Do you have any sense of of humor as power? I've always found it very threatening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we got that out. <laughs> I try not to think. It's it's hard to, it's painful to think about what other people think of you a lot. I, I try to write the books I want to find on the shelf and hope that I'm not so freaky that I you know that other people won't respond to it and and I I do have male readers but I don't yeah sure I'm sure some of it can seem in my novel the wife it's a funny angry book about the wife of a sort of you know bloated male novelist oh and it's being made into a film it's oh, been, it's great. coming out this summer with Glenn Close and Jonathan oh, Price that's fabulous. so I'm awesome. very excited and they're really fantastic she is so this angry wonderful performance <laughs> I, I guess you know, of course, a lot of humor has aggression in it, and I think that can be threatening to a lot of people. Mm. Um, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's a, it's got a sort of sweetness, and and it strikes a memory in you. It depends on the kind of humor. So I don't know. Uh, I want to go back to the issue um, that was in a certain East Coast newspaper a few years ago. Do you think anything's changed in publishing about how? Books are, I mean, we know women buy more books and read more books than men, but I, I always say to my husband, he's no idea what I'm reading. I'm like, you're so missing out. And he just very gets, sort of has a sense that, oh, that's the kind of book that you would read. That's not the kind of book I would read. Whereas I think when men write about things that are, that otherwise would be seen as female topics, everyone reads them. I would put Jonathan Franzen in that class. Um, I think The Marriage Plot was a great book, but it's a love triangle. And if you described it as a love triangle of three people in college, I think people would think, oh, that's a women's book. Um, and I'm just wondering, with the kind of books you write, the kind of discussions that are had with your editor and your agent and the publishing house about positioning and are women not encouraged or does the sort of literary world not look at women writers, you know, Kate Atkinson wrote a very gender, uh, genre busting book, which I think if a man had written, we would never hear the end of it. I'm just curious if you've seen change in, in your time in publishing. You know, um, 
I don't know. I'm not particularly present for those kind of positioning meetings. Uh, you know, I think the writer isn't really necessarily part of that. Uh, you, you, there's uh, my my publisher is wonderful, Riverhead. They do really important books, uh, and you know, by by men and women and uh, writers from around the world. And I, uh, my editor uh, publishes Lauren Groff, who's a wonderful writer. Uh, a lot of different writers I love, and I. I feel, you know, Vita, do you know the organization mm -hmm. Vita? They they do something called the count every year and they look at the number the numbers of women uh, and men who are published in important literary publications as reviewers and uh, as the subjects of reviews. And it's a mixed bag. It's definitely a mixed bag. Some places have made a point of changing and, and aiming for gender parity. For instance, uh, Rob Spillman, the editor of Tin House, when he saw what the numbers were, he vowed to go for equality. And he has you know, done that with that publication. I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that Jessamyn Ward has won the National Book Award twice, and yet, look, this is a long. We're gonna. It's gonna be a long time coming. It's a. It's a long struggle. Amazingly, even now, isn't it? It's true. But I opened that piece uh, in the New York Times about uh, with a with an anecdote from a party that I had been to, in which I met a man who, when he heard I was a writer, sort of asked about the kind of things that I wrote about, and I sort of said, you know, marriage or. Uh, sexual politics, family, uh, women, women and children, and he basically said, "Oh, you should talk to my wife," and like got the hell out of there, got a stiff drink. <laughs> um, but that is not true of all men. I mean, I, I do hear from a lot of men, and I, I, it's hard to take the pulse of the whole landscape because women apparently have been there are there are greater numbers of women fiction readers in general. But I, I think there are shifts, absolutely, but it's hard to really, we have to take the long view and look at it in 10 years. It's hard to know. Um, before you mentioned The Wife, I selfishly wanted you to talk about it because it's one of my favorite novels by you. Thank you, thank you. So, it's my sister. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just would love to hear what brought you to write that, what inspired that book. So the no in The Wife, it's it's one of the only real first person books that I've written and I've decided uh, these books, the, the Interestings and uh, The Female Persuasion and also The Ten Year Nap are kind of go into different points of view and they kind of move through the city and move through time and in a couple of cases. The Wife is this very pointed, first person, very, I hope, funny, angry book. Um, she's not exactly a reliable narrator. I, uh, some of the stuff that I watched with my mother when I was young, and I saw the way certain male writers were kind of lionized in a way, uh, and when my mother became a novelist, she's talked about this a lot, how some of the headlines in reviews were housewife turns novelist, as if, you know, I think she even said, like, as if she'd gone into a phone booth, <laughs> changed with an N on her chest, uh, like it was this feat. And I saw that, and it just seemed so unfair. But I, I don't know how I registered it as a child. I just sort of watched. I think that so much of writing is marinating and watching, 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 and then something kind of pops up and you're ready to write it. And I was ready to write it. I think also I was frustrated by my own kind of shyness as a writer up until that point. And, and now I kind of believe the motto is, if not now, when? I mean, do it. Just like write the thing. Like don't worry about what people will say. I'm, mostly they don't say anything. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's the truth, right? There is something worse than a bad review. It's, it's no review. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It is just a delight to have you here and to talk to you. Uh, Meg will sign books uh, at this table, so bring them up and uh, get Thank them you, signed. Ron. I really appreciate it's you. It's a delight. Thank you. This is great.